Hello and welcome to Soli Singleton, episode 196. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? And this is our elusive, sometimes present co-host, Christian. Lies from my grave. We're here for a wonderful episode filled with high spirits because it is time for us to talk about Wilds of Eldraine, Wilds of Eldraine Commander, Wilds of Eldraine Jumpstart, and all other subsidiaries, Copyright Wizards of the Coast, (laughs) whatever the fuck incorporated. Let's roll into this. Sounds good. Let's do it. All right, so we are doing this in our new style. We debated a full long form one, but we're recording this very last second and I want to spare the editor. It was honestly tough to cut down. Same. I had issues as well. People will see with our honorable mention section. It's it's basically a full hot takes. (laughs) We're cheating a lot. There's a couple cards I wish I was mentioning. I'm not, but like we're cheating on our five quite a bit here. This is going to be like 40 cards. Yeah. If anyone's (laughs) listening and they're like, you know, I missed the original hot takes style. I think we do sometimes as well it's just time is hard with me being on a different shift than them and it's tiring to make those like we're talking five plus hour recordings and it's rough on a saturday morning absolutely but this one yeah we're doing top fives but we've got honorable mentions let's start with some of those christian start us off get the elephant out of the room all right let me talk about four cards (laughs) yay so In my honorable mentions section here, I have two entries, but the first entry is four whole cards, and that's because they all fit into a similar theme, I guess you could say, which is that they're all good one-drop creatures. Every single one of them pretty much has a card that you can easily compare them to. So just to go over them relatively quickly here, we've got Cheeky House Mouse, a one-mana 2-1 in white that has an adventure. By the way, adventures are back. That's great. Um, This adventure is a sorcery called Squeak. By target creature you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn, and it can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater this turn. And it's a single white. This compares to Savannah Lions, obviously, or also Fairy Guide Mother. The next one is Embereth Veteran. It's a single red mana for a 2 1 human knight in Uncommon, and it has an activated ability of a single generic mana. Sacrifice this, and you create a young hero roll token attached to another target creature. Just to cover what that is, it's a whole wall of text. If you control another roll on it, put that one into the graveyard. Enchanted creature has whenever this creature attacks, if its toughness is three or less, put a plus and plus one counter on it. That shit sucks. All right, I'll be real with you. That shit sucks, but this is the first red uh two one for one with no downside and actually has an upside so wow that's true at uncommon mm-hmm. it's been so long that i just didn't think of that yeah we have plenty of good red one drops but none of them are just two ones for one so that's one reason why it's you can't just say oh i'll just ignore this like you can for white two ones where you just be like oh if that's shitty or annoying i'll just i've got seven others you kind of don't have many even though you got plenty so that's the other one then we've got harried spear guard it's a single red mana for a 1-1 human soldier with haste and when it dies you create a 1-1 black rat creature token with this creature can't block a uh, very reminiscent of nested shambler or more importantly doomed traveler traveler had fly on the token yeah but the the creature is just a 1-1 they're just comparisons that's all and then the last of these four is fairy dream thief which is a single black mana for a 1-1 uncommon fairy warlock It has flying. When it enters the battlefield, you surveil one, and it has an activated ability. Two and a black, exile, fairy, dream thief from your graveyard. You draw a card, and you lose a life. And this can be somewhat compared to fairy seer in blue, but instead in black. So all of these cards are similar to other things that we would be playing. In some cases, they're probably better than things that we are playing, and in some cases, they're probably slightly worse than other ones. Every single one of these, in my opinion, is absolutely playable. I have already done my cube update for this set. Every single one of them is in my cube, and I'm happy about their existence. With the caveat being Emberth Veteran, I hate the roll tokens, but that's more of a me thing. I like the rolls in a way. We'll get to it in my actual picks. But uh, the reason why none of these are in my top five is something I've discussed in the past, When we, especially when you have these shorter form they're supposed to be shorter form uh, (laughs) discussions. I don't like taking up one of my slots with just like, this is a two one for one. Right. And that's that's fair because there's a couple like toys that still might make my update for the year, but they're so personal that I don't want to add them to my list because people will be annoyed that I'm wasting a slot on something that no one but me is ever going to care about. 
Sure. And it's just one of those where it's like, yeah, Cheeky House Mouse, I'm Ruth Veteran. They're good cards. How much is there really to talk about it? Yeah, it's a 2-1 with an upside. Clap. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, like, I like them as honorable mentions because they are good. They should be brought up, but that's enough kind of thing. <laughs> yep. All right, Eric, do one of yours. I would like to talk about one that's specifically interesting for me. And this is Elevator of the Wild Court. It almost made my list. Two green white for a 4-4 legendary human knight. Whenever Elevator of the Wild Court enters the battlefield or attacks, create a virtuous roll token attached to another target creature you control. And that is enchanted creature gets plus one plus one for each enchantment you control. And whenever an enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. I'm a sucker for enchantment matters <laughs> it's something i've been trying to make happen for ever <laughs> yes the enchantment matters deck has been something that we've toyed with in my cube many times and lacks what i'll call modern good cards we have like you you have your 25 plus year old yep. enablers <laughs> that they consider to be mistakes in design but are the only time in magic history an enchantment has ever been playable and then you have like modern takes but are never pushed right and never have the correct accent pieces like enchantresses and stuff like that and when they do they're wildly overcosted or have other problems like we've gotten two or three in the past couple years that are like yeah, it's comparably interesting, but that's just not enough density. And I think one of the key things they did in this set was with the commander deck. There is like four or five pieces I wanted to put on my list Yeah, that help with the enchantment as a theme in your cube that doesn't feel so bad to draft. Exactly. This is an exciting card. I actually think one of my top five is the key most important card for that. But one of the things that is nice about the whole package here is that the roll tokens are enchantments. Yes. So mm -hmm. token enchantments are an important thing to have to make this work, especially because they're auras, which work with enchanted creatures carrying stuff and attaching and all of it together just kind of works well. I'm not sure that this is good enough. We still need more. But you would have to be running in a low power setting with high budget because some of these cards always end up being twenty thirty dollars. Yeah. Because yeah. of EDH. So you have to have an effort to make this be a draftable deck, in my opinion. But I wanted to shout it out because every time we get another one that's modern and close in expected power, it's like, OK, we're one step closer to yeah. maybe making it happen. So I'm interested and, in it, but... And the last couple times we had something like this, like with Theros and stuff, we yep. were putting disclaimers at the beginning of episodes, like, no, we're not covering the cards that are only good if yeah. you're running an enchantment <laughs> theme. Like, yeah, it, we'd be here all day covering stuff like that because it's not a very good deck, but it's one where these at least try to help it limp along. But like, we're getting to a point where it's starting to feel like it's a thing. Yeah, it's not the optimal thing yet, but it is a thing, so interested what do you got for my honorable we've got likeness looter i wanted to put it on my list but there's a problem with trying to do so likeness looter is blue and a black for a 1-1 creature fairy shapeshifter with flying and you guessed it tap draw a card then discard a card and then it also has pay x likeness looter becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with mana value x except it has flying and this ability activate only as a sorcery this card reads like a custom card it's Kinda so does. fun yeah i like it i don't think it's the highest power level card no it's a looter <laughs> <laughs> yes. And a clone. It's a looter that requires color color. And the body double effect costs quite a bit of mana to activate and you stop looting at that point. So it's like the become end game now moment. It gives it lasting effect later in the game. It's a fine card. I think it has the problem of obviously it's blue black. And I think it's even more than just like a fine card. I think it's cool, but it's blue black and... That section has a lot of cool cards that don't make it because, you know, if you're playing Tezzerits, you have to play the Tezzerits. If you're playing Ninjas, you have to play the Ninjas. If you're playing Artifact decks, you have to play Tezzerits and other Artifact deck enabling cards. Yeah. If you're playing Ninjas, you're playing a bunch of Ninjas and Tempo-oriented cards. So the only time that this is really going to make your list is if you're playing just, I don't have any theme deck in blue-black, it's just 
good stuff control, at which point I'm not playing your cube, so I don't care what you put in your cube anymore. But Lightness Looter is a sweet card, and I hope it's there. Yeah, it is a very cool card, but... I don't know if it could get there power-wise to actually matter. All right, Christian, you got another uh, honorable mention for us? I sure do. I've got one tough cookie. No. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday morning, bitch. (laughs) All right, so tough cookie is one and a green for an uncommon 2-2 artifact creature food golem. Golem. Golem is a character who doesn't have a magic card, thank God. Are we going to do this for the rest of our life? Also, he does, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. They wouldn't do that. That would be stupid. Oh, okay. Uh (laughs) When Tough Cookie enters the battlefield, create a food token. And also, two and a green. Target non-creature artifact you control becomes a 4-4 artifact creature until end of turn. And finally, it's got the normal food text of two tap sack, you gain three life. All right, so it's it's got a great name. It does. Let's be real. Fun little R. Yeah. It's two mana for a 2-2 that makes a food token, which is not cubable on its own, but it is worth a card, at least. And then you add on the activated ability, and that just adds to that fact. So I don't think that this is insane, which is why that this is an honorable mention instead of my top five, but I am interested in this card. You can make the food token and threaten the 4-4 blocker, which can be good versus aggro. If it's off the top deck, you know, you've got six power and toughness in a single card, which is nice. And if you're up against control, you can kind of be a significant source of damage over and over again without expending cards. But it is vanilla at the end of the day. My only real problem with it is it's green. So the artifactness is kind of just a downside. And like, you know, when it enters, it makes another artifact and it has an ability that makes artifacts creatures like that's all doing the artifacty things, but then it's like, oh, it's green. I simply read it as turn the food you made into yeah. a four four, which is the way that it needs to be read because it is green. And yeah, but I feel like if this was blue, I'd have a lot more interest in it. Yeah, it'd be a lot more interesting. But at the same time, you know, like you said, green notoriously has issues with two drops, right? Because of the the mana elf curve, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's still something I'm trying to figure out, not how it works, but just like how to get around that, I guess. Yeah, solutions that are not just ignore it. Right. Yeah, (laughs) because like (laughs) I'm just I'm kind of bored of my one and two drops in green just being like 10 to 15 mana dorks and being like, I don't know why there's no depth to my Simic section, you know, or whatever. It's just like it's because half your cards are just mana dorks, of course. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking to find things like this that can allow me to try to branch out and see if it sticks yeah it's unfortunate because like my normal go-to for people who are having that problem is go play a flash deck or something yeah you can't do that no i tried (laughs) yeah that doesn't work at uncommon it does not work the counters deck just feels bad because you know you could just be playing green white and most of the reasons to play it at blue green would be at rare exactly so the the blue green section is the least deep this isn't really a blue green card but i don't know it could be i guess it's not really supposed to be i could argue it yeah it's really like it works anywhere because of the artifact synergy yep sure. it's a mid-range card however you look at it that's what i'm treating it as if you're trying to be aggressive you don't necessarily want to go two drop this into cool i'll make the four four an attack like you still want to be putting pressure on it's when you've got that flexibility against the aggro deck or the control deck this i think really starts to shine all right eric you want to give us another yeah let's move on to uh cruel somnophage one in a black for a star star nightmare cruel somnophage's power and toughness are each equal to the number of creature cards in all graveyards and it has an adventure can't wake up one in a blue sorcery adventure target player mills four cards this one is also very dresden referencey is it wake me up inside it's a slight twist on it but it's related to a dresden one there's a couple cards where i'm like this is literally the exact same twist that dresden did on a fairy tale thing that's fair and also good job christian that thank you save me (laughs) i have problems with this card because it's demir for same reasons and it's rare and yeah like, it and likeness looter could be argued together as a i'm going to play blue black self mill reanimator blah 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 that would be an interesting take kind of thing if you're pushing that direction in blue black then you could add both of them yeah i just really think the whole package here is very cool there's a lot of synergy in the card itself yeah and the fact that it's 
all graveyards helps that little bit of like, okay, I'm not so worried about having to accidentally fuck something up. <laughs> yeah. And it it's neat with like Urbog, Lurgoyf, yep. which I'm a big fan of. I think that's like my one, like, it reminded me of that. And I'm like, yep. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy playing Hedron Crab in my cube right now. I'm the target audience for this card. I think you have to either play it as a monocolor card, knowing it's got the bonus of the second color, or you have to cut a Demir card for it. And I don't know which I would do to try to force this in. Yeah, I know that you joked about if you're playing a, a cube without you know, just general Demir or whatever, you don't want to play it. But I think having like Lightness Looter and Cruel Somniphage with this self mill mm -hmm. graveyard doing the whole, like that's the engine that you're trying to make the theme. I think that's cool. Yeah, and it's possible that both of these honorables make my cube. I have problems with them that hang them up for me right now. So what's your next honorable? Uh, so for me, I want to shout out Pollen Shield Hair. It starts off as hair raising, a single green sorcery adventure. The puns on this card murder me. It's target creature you control gains vigilance and gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. And then you can cast it as its creature self for Pollen Shield Hair, one in a white for a 2-2 two -two creature rabbit with creature tokens you control get plus one plus one. Obviously this is intangible virtue on legs, even without including the green bonus mode. And I think that it very much is just a green bonus mode. Like, we're here for the creature. If you happen to have the adventure on it, whatever, sure, it's cool. I do think the adventure is good bonus points, though. So green-white is a famous mid-range token color pair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to be playing that deck, then playing this on, like, turn four or turn five to alpha and going, like, pump this token to be huge, play this, everyone gets bigger, swing, kill you. Yep, yeah. That's a very valid play line that could be incredibly strong on this card. I have issues with the card. I kind of wish it had just been uncommon. I think it would have a lot more argument in Christian's cube than mine. If you're very heavily into tokens, though, it's definitely worth going to. Like, try this card out. I actually have some interest on this for cubes that were lower power that don't have quite as many answers to the token deck intangible virtue can be oppressive i don't agree with that i've never seen a token deck be the best deck in a cube i mean it was when we built the board game cube you don't play my cube uh yeah okay so <laughs> inarguably the most powerful board game cube deck so in lower powered where you have less board wipe like you, yeah. you still have board wipes that can take care of tokens so you would you would think it wouldn't matter, but the problem is that when you're designing the cube, you don't want to just fill it with the shitty board wipes, right? Because no, nobody wants them, right? So yeah. what ends up happening is you have this weird dichotomy where the token decks are really fun. Everyone wants to play them. And then also they're really powerful because the other archetypes don't have the toys that the tokens do at Uncommon. So That's I regularly fair. had to be pulling back the strength of token decks and putting in like more niche effects and other colors just to combat that and a lot of those actually get blown out by intangible virtue like effects so that might actually have more of a negative effect than you realize right and i think that pollen shield hair does a great job of giving the token deck the power that it needs to actually close games while still being answerable with just you know without having to sculpt the answers but at the same time if you're in a, like, actually, like, Brad's cube, you know, we're, we're not really worried about having answers, the budget, that kind of stuff. I have more worry of making it, a token deck playable compared yeah. to literally anything else. Yeah, yeah, I was like, it's not the problem. Pollen Shield here is probably not good because it is so fragile. Yeah, you could just be playing a Planeswalker. Yeah. Who shits out tokens incidentally. <laughs> so, I like this being, like, the honorable mention call out because... I think there are some cubes out there that could use it as like this is how we can create the balance i agree with you though that sh for cube uncommon should be where it's at <laughs> yeah but it i still think if you're the type of person pushing tokens in your cube it's very good even at rare like i still run intangible virtue yeah so, Christian, are you out of honorables now? I have, but I know there's one Eric kind of wanted me to talk about. Yeah, I want to force you to talk about Lord Skitter's Butcher. Okay. Eric likes rats, guys. Rats, rats. We are the rats. 
<laughs> oh shit, a rat. <laughs> So this is Lord Skitter's Butcher. Two and a black for an uncommon 2-3 rat peasant. Love that. I do love that. I love yeah. the peasant creature type. <laughs> He's just like you, for real, for real. I know. <laughs> but that, that's exactly what I look like at like 3 in the morning when I'm walking around the house naked, but I want to eat something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to make sure he to have He doesn't have those the, long, uh, luscious hat. locks you do. Yeah. <laughs> we, st- we have the same body type, though. <laughs> So this creature, when it enters the battlefield, you choose one. And there are three options. The first is create a 1-1 black rat creature token with this creature can't block. The second is you may sacrifice another creature. If you do scry two, then draw a card. And the third is creatures you control gain menace until end of turn. This is a nice card. It's very flexible and it can fit into a number of different decks. I think that the one place where this doesn't work very well would be if you're in more of a control style deck just because the rat token can't block and it also can't sacrifice itself. So it gets a little awkward in those decks, but in almost every other deck, it has some option that you're happy with. It having that third option to potentially just end games is very interesting as well. It reminds me of Mogus's Marauder in that way. I have cubed Mogus's Marauder before in the past and it was totally respectable. The problem it had was that it was only good in that one deck. So this kind of shores up that problem a little bit. I think that what's interesting, I recently did a big cube update. And one thing that I noticed was the three drop slot in every color is becoming quite stacked at this point, to the point where I'm having to really consider cutting what feel like staples. The only caveat to that was black. Black three drop creatures, while there are some very good ones, I'm looking at you, Yeheni. That'll be a whole other episode. Oh yeah, we need to do that episode very soon. Yeah. Yeah, a few uh, rarity drops. But black's three drop creatures are very feast or famine, right? Like right now we've got Yeheni, and then you've got other totally good things, but they fall off incredibly quickly. And so because of that, it's very easy to play Lord Skitter's Butcher because it's just, this thing got printed and now it's already like the second or third maybe fourth best black three drop creature (laughs) yeah that's fair like i said i wanted to hear what you had to say about it on air because like mogus's marauder's problem was it was only one deck Mm -hmm. this works out pretty well in like the aristocrats kind of deck as well and just general aggro so like it has more options but i can understand that Because some of the other things that you've gotten, it's not quite as exciting as it could have been. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, it's totally a respectable card. I have put it in my queue for sure. It'll probably stick around for, I don't know. What's the current estimate? Probably a year, maybe. Yeah. This feels like a card that'll last for a year to me right now. Maybe a little bit more. Maybe a little more. But that's good, by the way. Options are good, yeah. A year and a half to two years for a cube card is a good rate currently. Which is weird to talk about. I know, and I hate that fact, but it is kind of true. Especially for just like, this is a generic creature, right? Like, it's not doing something extremely unique. Okay, so... All right, let's have Eric talk about the obvious omission we're about to have. I want to do the call out for just all the courts, essentially. Supreme court, local courts. Yeah. All good. All perfect in all their decision making. And... (laughs) At some point in the future, I do want to have a more in-depth discussion on these and and Monarch, but this is a hot take, so no, but they do need to be brought up. They're at least interesting, and some of them are good. Okay, so obviously they're all Monarch cards. And they're lower drop, you know, four drops. Eh, I wouldn't say they're lower drop. They're not lower drop. They're they're very middle of the road to a higher drop on Monarch in a normal unpowered cube. You're forgetting we have things that I don't even run because they're so unfun, like the blue one. Well, yeah, that's true. I actually just banned Fall from Favor in my cube. Yeah. Yeah, that card's busted in half. So we've got options like that. So the courts aren't low drop. The courts, I think, are a more fair Monarch card than some. They pump out value, which is good. They do something even if you lose Monarch, so that's cool. They don't feel overly oppressive. Looking at you, staunch throne guard. Oh, yeah. So there's probably better options for Monarch, but these ones are pretty solid for people who are sick of certain Monarch options. Um, I do think they're not all built equal here. I think the most fun of the bunch is Court of Lothwain. Of course you think that. (laughs) I know, right? It's such a fun card. It it is fun, but like... Oh, it gaunties every turn. (laughs) Yeah. And if, if you're the Monarch, fuck paying. 
true. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they're fun cards. I think they may cause problems for a lot of people. I know a lot of people are sick of Monarch. It's a rough one. Monarch can be done right, by the way. Monarch can be done right. Absolutely. It's a very strong mechanic, though. The later in the curve it goes, the better it plays. Does that make sense, what I just said? It depends. Like, the best Monarch cards in unpowered or higher cubes tend to be ones that set themselves up. So Palace Jailer is obviously the iconic one. That one also just got banned. I would hope. The ones that you're banning are the ones that... (laughs) Those are the good ones. Yep. Yeah. Those are the ones that at unpowered see a lot of play. They are good. You can run them. Some of these might be very fun. I don't know if I'm running any of them. I might run two as tests to see if I like them. And like I said, at some point, we'll do a more focused episode because there's a whole thing about the more monarch you include, the different things and changes. But like this iteration of the courts have no immediate outliers of holy fucking shit but also they're not like terrible so it's the healthiest iteration of a monarch cycle i'll put it that way all right what do you got for honorable mention i'm gonna do two at once so that we're done what the fuck two at once i can't believe you'd do that what the hell brad how dare i (laughs) So uh, the first one is Kellen the Fae Blooded, which is two and a red for a 2-2 legendary creature, Human Fairy. It's got double strike and other creatures you control get plus one plus oh for each aura and equipment attached to Kellen the Fae Blooded. It is also an adventure with Birthright Boon, one and a white for a sorcery adventure. Search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, put it into your hand and shuffle. I like this card. It's a Boros equipment card and it happens to work with auras if you want to try to make that a thing. Which is super cool, by the way. Yeah, I don't think this is the greatest card ever made, but I play some pretty bad cards to try to push this as an archetype right now, and I would love to play this. I would love to play this without the adventure at Uncommon. Yeah, the adventure is so important, though. I know, but I'm trying to think of a way to make it Uncommon playable. (laughs) Or not playable, but printable. (laughs) It's just a very good card. Ignoring everything else is a 2-2 double strike for 3, which is not the worst base stat line, right? Right. It's a fine stat line in combat. And it does have some bonus because like in that deck, you're going to have at least one equipment. (laughs) Yes, it's very common that Kellen here is going to be wearing a Jite or a sword or at least a Eater of Virtue. These are all very reliable things to have Kellen equipped with, and they're all very scary. That's without getting into hilarity like grafted war gear. Oh. Yeah, but at the same time, your three drops in red, if you're not trying to do the equipment... It can't make it on its own merit without no. the equipment deck being pushed. But if you're doing it, it's kind of all in one package, and it has the fallback of being a fine three drop red creature, so yeah. Yes. For me, this is a slam dunk. For a lot of other people, it's going to be a pass, and that's fine. My last honorable mention has nothing to do with cube, but it warmed the cock of my balls. <laughs> Hilda of the Icy Crown (laughs) is two white blue for a 3-4 legendary creature human warlock with whenever you tap an untapped creature an opponent controls, you may pay one. When you do, choose one. Create a 4-4 white and blue elemental creature token, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control, or scry two, then draw a card. This card reminds me of peak EDH legendary creatures. (laughs) <laughs> before they would shove 45 of them custom made to be busted down your throat every set when you could just find a legendary in a set that you jive with and you're like i'm gonna make a twiddle deck yep this is the type of thing that makes me remember the good old days the theros era to 2018 2019 era where like We were at the peak amount of, they were like, hey, we should randomly toss legendary on creatures that are interesting so that people play them in EDH. But we were not to the point of EDH is literally the lifeblood of our pocketbook. Continue (laughs) pumping out EDH to make these fucks pay us. Yeah, it does remind me of that kind of era and it is cool it has nothing to do with cube but it 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 warmed my shitty heart and that's hard to do it is very very difficult to do which is so funny because it's such a cold card yeah all right so let's let's get into our top fives we're finally actually into our top five an hour into this (laughs) and we'll see you all next week and this is why (laughs) we said this is pretty close to a normal hot takes yeah yep all right let's start off with christian here all right let me do some crack the knuckles a little stretch get into it here okay so number five i'm gonna start off with a card called solitary sanctuary 
Solitary Sanctuary is two and a white for an uncommon enchantment. When Solitary Sanctuary enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. This also has, whenever you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Okay, so this card read really well to me at first, but then I kind of like fell off from it a little bit and I didn't think it was good, but I like I came back around. I'm very iffy on this card. It's a really fun build around, and as a person on our Discord pointed out, it can go really nutty with some of the white five drop creatures. Gitzerai Monk is really good with it, and especially Elite Skill Guard. Elite Skill Guard with this is nuts. Gitzerai Monk is five mana for a flyer that taps all the opponent's creatures when it enters, and Elite Skill Guard is a plus and plus one counter matters card. When it enters the battlefield, you bolster two, which you put two counters on something. And then when a creature you control with a counter on it attacks, you tap target creature defending player controls. So they both kind of feed into each other a little bit in that way. And both of those cards are totally playable. So that's why that's important. Interesting. It's also kind of fun alongside Gideon's Law Keeper and also alongside Icy Manipulator, Pacification Array. All of these cards are totally playable and some of them I do play. Uh, some of them I like Icy Manipulator and Pacification Array. I brought back in because of introducing this card. Yeah. So all of those things are, are fun and it, it feels, I don't know about as the opponent but as the player it feels fun to try to build around it a little bit you don't have to maybe try that hard no nah, you just sprinkle a couple extra in and uh it could be fun yeah well let's talk about some of the downsides right so this is a three mana white enchantment if there's one thing my cube does not need it's three mana white cards it's a four mana two four with a oh. <laughs> I have more white three drop creatures than any other thing in my cube. And we have like, okay, let's say you're like, oh, I'm going to put this in like a control style deck, right? You're already playing every single Banishing Light Oblivion Ring that you can get your hands on. I mean, there's a point where like we have enough depending on the size of your cube. Sure. And I'm already not playing them all. Yeah. But my point is that when you're drafting and when you're building your deck, you just get to a point where you don't want your whole deck to be three drops. Sure. And there also becomes a point where you're like, okay, in my, let's say, control deck, would I rather play this card or just another Oblivion Ring? The answer is another Oblivion Ring, as long as you are trying to win, right? I think these things kind of go against this card. But on the flip side, it is a bit more interesting. It's got a few reminiscent feelings of like Drake Haven, like, hey, mm -hmm. let's kind of sculpt the deck a little bit differently to get advantage. I just don't know if Solitary Sanctuary has the payoff is my problem. Right, and you could also, I mean, we're not even talking about scenarios where it just kind of whiffs, right? Like, let's say you tap the opponent's creature down with it, but you don't have a creature on the field to even take advantage of it. Yeah. There are going to be scenarios where that happens. Yeah, one of the, one of the biggest problems I have with it is like the default case is just a single turn off, kind of. Notably much worse than an oblivion ring would be yeah but like i mean it's still it is cool i like it <laughs> yeah it felt like it was perfectly placed in a number five spot for me all right eric your turn i've got charming scoundrel for my number five this is one in a red for a one one human rogue with haste and when it enters the battlefield choose one discard a card then draw a card create a treasure token Create a wicked roll token attached to a target creature you control. What's a wicked roll token? Doesn't say on the card. It's plus one, plus one, and when the token gets thrown into a graveyard, your opponent takes a damage. It's very bad in my opinion, but... I agree it's weak, but it's fine in this style deck. True. Like, this is the style of deck that that, that wicked roll can actually be fine. Yeah, because it lets you be a 2-2 two, two haste that when they kill it, they still take an extra damage. Yep, which, not amazing, but still gets the job done. My question with the card, where are we going with it? When are we using the treasure? When are we using the discard draw? What's going on here? Are we just playing this in aggro? You're doing discard draw when you're hellbent and this isn't going to be enough to end the game and you're using the treasure basically never unless you're like really screwed. I think the treasure can work out with doubling up your turn three. Do you do that in an aggro deck, really? Yeah, compared to just having the extra power for the extra turn. It's like, tough. I'm not saying a 2-2 two -two haste is the worst thing ever, but I'm saying like I have a feeling this is going to play like that a lot. I, I agree. The discard, then draw, 
will come up a decent amount of times just because those decks generally have you're trying to skimp as much as possible and cut corners so your opening hands can be loose and that can help out the treasure token yeah it's probably not amazing on this card i guess sometimes it'll be useful for color correct type stuff but is mode one and two like not only but is that pairing supposed to be when you play this in a grill deck that's to me, sort of. Mode 1 is clearly meant for when you're hellbent. It doesn't have the yeah. clause where if you have no hand, you still can't draw. It doesn't have the, if you did, then draw. Yeah, yeah. it's it's the post-board wipe. You draw this card and you're like, fuck, I need to draw my five power hasty boy, not this. Exactly. It also has like the aspect of, I've got three lands in my hand because I kept a two land and I've drawn all lands. Fair. <laughs> Fucking get rid of it and give me something. I guess the next question would be, what do you have at two in your queue? It's not the most exciting, but there is openings for a two drop aggro card that has some interest. And the problem is I was going with a bunch of different slants to try to make equipments matter and stuff like that. So I'm not running just the best possible two drop aggro creatures. I'm trying to go and directions gotcha so yes this is more powerful than a couple cards especially in the list right now on but it's arguably in the realm of those aggro creatures and two drop yeah you could play it and be very happy i just it's not one i believe in what do you think if you put this in your cube today what do you think lasts longer, this or Lord Skitter's Butcher? This in your cube or that in my cube? What do you think lasts longer? This will last one set. I will take this out in three months. So that's an argument against it, I think. Unless you're somebody who's like really, really... Like if you're cubing every week, okay, yeah, sure, try it out. If you're cubing every six months, probably fucking don't worry about it. Uh, so for my number five, we have a much stronger card, in my opinion. Decadent Dragon is two red red for a 4-4 four, four flying train. Example, whenever Decadent Dragon attacks, create a treasure token. It also has expensive taste, which is two and a black for an instant adventure. Exile the top two cards of target opponent's library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. Ignoring the black part of this card, it's still possibly in the top five four drops possible in red yeah i mean depending on what you're trying to do if you're just like generic looking at it it's definitely up there a four four frample that creates a treasure for four is a good ass rate in mid-range and aggro and then the the black part is just icing on the cake you won't use it commonly but like when you use it it's gonna be a ha this will be funny yeah I didn't bring this one up because I've just been kind of annoyed with the uh, everything makes a treasure token. <laughs> he says, well, picking a card just now that makes a fucking treasure token. That was the weakest part of the card. He did say, I don't know where that goes. So I really like this card specifically because it feels very at home in aggro while being a good Jundi mid-range value card. Yeah, sometimes you really need that treasure token because you're looking for that fifth or sixth mana. Importantly, this doesn't color correct the Gonti ability. Oh. So the treasure matters, which is why I like it in a Jundi mid rangey green is included, color fixing, you've got some birds, stuff like that. This is going to be a fantastic Jundi mount card. Yeah. But at times, you're literally just going to go, four drop dragon does a lot of damage, put in deck in red. Yeah. Remove or die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it is a very fun looking card and a powerful enough one to include. Christian. All right. Number four. Hey, this isn't one card, you fucker. I know. Yeah, I was going to say, Brad, you know what I love doing? I love being a hypocrite. So my number four is two cards. It was primarily Shrouded Shepherd, but I tacked on Frolicking Familiar. Oh, I'm glad you did, because I really like that one. It's so fucking cute. God damn it. So let's read the cards first here. First, we have Shrouded Shepherd. One and a white for a 2-2 Uncommon Spirit Warrior. It's a creature. When Shrouded Shepherd enters the battlefield, target creature you control gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. Both of these cards also have adventures. So for Shrouded Shepherd, it has a sorcery called Cleave Shadows for one and a black. Creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Uh, moving to Frolicking Familiar, this is a two and a blue, two, two uncommon Otter Wizard. That's the biggest upside to this card. It is pretty fucking adorable. It's so adorable. I absolutely <laughs> love this card. It's very great art. And to be honest, this is more of a fun Harry Potter card than the entirety of Strixhaven. <laughs> That's so true. I mean, Otter Wizard is just a strict upgrade from Lizard 
Withered Wizard as, as far as I'm concerned. Ooh, true. To finish it off, this card has flying, so it's a 2-2 two, two flyer for three. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, it also gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. And then its adventure is a single red mana instant called Blow Off Steam. Blow Off Steam deals one damage to any target. This is a great R&D question. Flying Prowess would have fit in the box easier and would have been cleaner looking. Why did you go for Strictly Worth Prowess when you have to type it out when Prowess is in the set? Yeah, and I also don't think it makes the card busted by doing that at all. I wonder if it's a purely for flavor they didn't want artifacts and enchantments to trigger it. Maybe because of the... Enchantment theme and they don't want it played in an enchantment Yeah, the deck. role. Or, yeah, I can see the reason, but it feels off. Yeah. So I have these grouped because they follow like a lot of the same design space. Yeah. And there's a rare mythic type thing going on that we're using cards from, but I'm not talking about them all together because I'm not a hypocrite or a cheater. (laughs) You see how my five and my four are part of that cycle and two of my honorables are part of that cycle. Eric's doing one of that. We didn't throw them all together. He's doing two of it even. Ooh. Yeah. What are we going to talk about, guys? The Suspense. (laughs) So anyway, back to the actual analysis. Uh, So they're both on-rate creatures, and that on its own wouldn't be cubable, but obviously with adventures, they have a mediocre removal spell attached, and that makes it a good card. The difference between the uncommons and the rares. The rares are not mediocre. Yeah, exactly. Right. They have a strong removal spell attached to something. <laughs> a strong card with a strong spell attached. I do like the frolicking familiars. Just like, just here's a damage. You know, you, you've got a red open, just toss the damage somewhere. Gut shot. Yeah. How many games of Modern have been solved off a of gut shot? It's surprisingly, you can set up board states that like one damage is a lot more than it sounds kind of thing. Here's one of them. Turn one, Lanwar Elf. <laughs> 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 nice bird, idiot. All right. So these cards, we actually already discussed the problem with them and why there's a difference between playing these kinds of effects at uncommon versus in your fancy expensive cubes. I find this to be a little bit, as a cube designer, a little bit of a frustrating design space simply because more often than not, these are multicolored cards. For you, absolutely. You can't do like I did where I'm like, the dragon's just pretty fucking good. Yeah, you don't, like, and this is something I had to really accept the fact that it's like, even if, let's say, Shrouded Shepherd, you can say, oh, you, that's totally playable in an aggro deck. Sure, it is playable, but you're going to cut it. You're going to cut it because when you do a draft, you're going to have better cards. They're no longer, at least for me, I no longer have the situations that I used to run into years ago where it's like you need these generically okay cards to fill out your decks because there's not enough good cards. We have a lot of good cards now. I would say that Frolicking Familiar has more chance than Shrouded Shepherd by a long shot. I don't think they're in the same league. Like, Frolicking Familiar is almost to the point where I could consider it as a, like, "Mm, it's probably not good enough, but it'll be fun for a couple drafts. Just because it scales so well. Yeah, just having flying on something that can continuously get further scaling. The problem with Shrouded Shepherd is, like, it's a two-drop, two-two that sometimes just does nothing because you just needed to keep on curve and great. (laughs) I also think that when you do the four mana mode, Shrouded Shepherd's better though. Right, because you would expect to have your own board state and you're making theirs. Yeah, okay. That's why I don't think it's as cut and dry as that. Let's say a Frolicking Familiar is in your opening hand. In my cube, one sixth of all cards get murdered by it. Cards, that includes instant sorceries, things that don't have power and toughness. Yeah. One out of six cards in my cube dies to this immediately. That's fair. It scales well. And then it's got a good body on top. But the problem is, is it is a rough one. And I'm not considering it a mono blue card. And for an is it section, you basically have to be at uncommon, in my opinion, to let this get in without just playing favorites, which is fine. And even uncommon has a bunch of like, they've got Sahili and they've got Sprite Dragon. Yeah, like, yeah, like I don't even play Sprite Dragon like that got pushed out. I, that feels fucked up to me because I play Sprite Dragon. That card is strong as fuck. It's strong. It just wasn't the design space I was trying to push. That's fair. It's just like Frolic and Familiar is the spellsy deck. 
cool, awesome, but there's other packages that just kind of are better generally. This whole discussion, though, we're having the exact discussion that I felt like I needed to have, which is that these are multicolored cards. Uh, they have to be, especially for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I have them both in my cube in the monocolored section because I didn't feel like making the, I certainly didn't feel like making the Orzov cut for Shroud and Shepard. I considered making the Izzet cut for Frolicking Familiar, but as we just discussed, that's kind of a hard thing to push as well. Like I'm not getting rid of third path iconoclast for this, right? What is Joe and Apprentice Sorcerer doing? That's a new card. I just want to try it out. Okay. It says you can look at the top card of your library. I it does know, say you can look at the top there. card of your library. <laughs> <laughs> it was in my long form hot takes list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is the wizard just better than like battle or battle mage captain? I mean, probably, but they do different things. I don't know that they do. <laughs> well, you don't have many creatures in play in a blue red spells deck. Yes, you do. Uh, okay, you might have some tokens. Yes, Sahili, Third Past Iconoclast, Young Pyromancer, Murmuring Mystic. Those decks generally have tokens. <laughs> the Is It Spellslinger decks actually end up going super wide pretty often yeah which is why i got rid of sprite dragon because they were more often doing that and sprite dragon felt weird that's fair i forget you're very token heavy in that deck mm -hmm. <laughs> remember the earlier conversation when we were saying token decks never do anything <laughs> yeah i forget you get every token card you just don't get any of other effect this gets into why i don't like rarity restricted stuff at times it, interesting for a mental challenge but like there's a couple gaps that are just like this could easily be filled there's no reason not to. why is it so hard to find a board wipe yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean these are interesting ones to bring up and i think i would see shrouded shepherd not making it too long but frolicking familiar actually playing out pretty well so i agree with that assessment all right i'm gonna cheat <laughs> here's your top five number fours you bastards here's, here's number four <laughs> it has five cards in it <laughs> we're gonna slowly turn the top five format we're like we're everything's evolving into crabs everything's evolving into original hot takes it's evolving just backwards <laughs> <laughs> so these are the man lands and really i only want to talk about two of them but they're all fine there are some good ones yeah the green blue one is three green blue until end of turn it becomes a five five with trample and whenever it attacks up to one target creature has base power and toughness three three until end of turn and the red white one is one red white for restless bivouac becomes a two two red and white ox creature token until end of turn it's the land and whenever it attacks put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control oh that's cool the red white one is awesome and holy shit do we need to get rid of all of the other possible options that have ever been thought of because <laughs> god damn do i hate needle spires oh yeah we don't even play that don't pretend it's there it's just like this is the right way of doing the boros man land you're right. This is finally aggressive enough. It doesn't even force the plus one plus one counter on itself. Yeah, that's the part that I really like. It's doing what you want to do. It's not like, a, here's eight mana to activate this aggressive. No, fucking stop it. I like Restless Fire for a very similar reason. So Restless Fire is the blue-red one. So it's blue-red. It becomes a 2-1 elemental with, as long as it's your turn, it has first strike. And whenever it attacks, scry one. Oh yeah, that seems cool too. Because it's essentially three mana to use it for the scry, it's not too bad because a two power first striker in a lot of board states will get through. First strike's good on defense too. It's only on your turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Missed that part. If it worked that way, this would be the strongest man land. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Imagine My the bad. blue player holding up mana all turn. <laughs> And just being able to eat your goblin guide. Yeah. Oh, fuck. The only problem I have with Restless Spire is the fact that it's a land means that they're going to commit more resources to make sure it dies kind of thing. It is a fair knock against it. I agree that I still think Wandering Fumaroles might still be better, but it's at least it's a it's an argument between those two. Yeah. And I mean, like the white black and the black green are still also perfectly reasonable i'm i'm not the biggest fan of hissing quagmire to begin with so i'll i'll listen to an argument for russ's cottage i like the whole cycle i'm glad we're talking about them i'm sure several of them will make my cube yeah and all of the like you could actually include the cycle and you'd be fine but i'm mostly here for the red white one that's the like we had a gap that i felt was kind of needed to be filled with a reasonable option and now we have it 
and the blue green one i think is like probably the best out of what we have just because it's going to work out well in that deck. But I really like that a new generation of Magic players get to learn what the word bivouac is. Yeah, I definitely know what a bivouac is. You don't remember it from Cons of Tarkir? I bivouacked it off last night. Oh, bivouac these nuts. All right, so my number four is Elusive Otter, which is a single blue mana for a 1-1 <laughs> one, one creature otter with prowess. Creature... <laughs> This is... I tried so hard to get away before I could laugh. Creatures with power less than Elusive Otter's power can't block it. It also has Grove's Bounty, which is X and a green for a sorcery adventure. Distribute X plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures you control. Brad? Yes. How come your mom lets your otter have prowess? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Life ain't fair. We just had a conversation and it made sense. And they're like, yeah, but the rare can have prowess. Well, yeah, yeah, obviously. (laughs) Yeah, that's why I have some questions. I really like this card a lot. (laughs) I do as well. I'm glad you put it on here. I like otters. It's a good glue card. It works so many places. So like you've got prowess for that, obviously. We just had the conversation. It can't get blocked by things that are smaller than it. So if you start pumping, then you can get it through no problem to actually get a clock in your deck that probably has an issue with that. And then from the blue green standpoint with the plus one plus one counters, that's exactly where we're trying to push things. And it works in that deck. It's a good glue piece where you'll be like 23rd card or probably better than that sometimes in several decks in the colors. You're allowed to go wide. You're allowed to go tall with the counters. That's a nice flexibility that they sometimes don't allow. Yeah, it's not like put one on that many creatures where you're like, eh, whatever. Right, or put it all on one where it's yeah. just like, okay, I guess, <laughs> kill it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and like early game, maybe you just ignore it and go for the otter for whatever you're doing, but I probably hold on to it a bit. I mean, there's definitely some aggro-based spellsy decks that I'd be like, yeah, let's play it turn one. I want you dead on turn four. I mean, overall, I do actually like Elusive Otter as like, it's just a nice little package. All right, let's move back to Christian, move on to top three. We're getting close. This is only gonna be like three hours long. All right, for number three, I have another adventure card. This is Hearth Elemental. Five and a red for a four, five creature elemental at uncommon. This spell costs X less to cast, where X is the number of cards in your graveyard that are instants, sorceries, and or cards that have an adventure. It also has a sorcery adventure, Stoke Genius. I almost read it as Stroke Genius. That's Brad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When we're done, baby. (laughs) Stoke Genius is one in a red. Discard your hand, then draw two cards. I went back and forth on this card a lot too, but it obviously ended up pretty high on my list. So one of the things that I like about this card, as well as any card with adventure, is that they don't have the problem that a lot of these Spellslinger decks cards typically have, which is that most of the payoffs are creatures and you don't want to play that many creatures in those decks. And that's been a a consistent issue for me because they keep printing these cards that are payoffs and the payoffs always seem like totally there. And then you go to build the deck and you're like, I've got fucking seven payoffs because nobody else wants these cards. So I get them every time and I've got like eight spells. (laughs) I think this card is very good. I agree. It's obviously not like uh, Gurmag Angler on the one side. Delve is very different from this effect. However, uh, it has that same sort of vibe to it, right? Where it's like, oh, it doesn't have any abilities. It's just a big creature. Yeah, but if that big creature costs two, that can be pretty good. We actually have a comparison at Rare that's pretty nice in Bedlam Reveler. Same kind of idea, but that's a fun card. Absolutely. It's very nice being able to have your payoffs also be the spells. Because adventures are just so good, it's not a split card. It is a split card, but it's not an or, right? It's an and. Yeah. So you get the late game Stoke Genius, and then you probably in the same turn in many scenarios, if it's like turn five or six or something like that, you just discard your hand because this is the last card in it, draw two cards, and then you can play one of those, or you can just play out your four or five. That's a nice line of play as well. You can even have scenarios where your deck may just be okay playing Stoke Genius, and maybe you're not playing a spells deck, but just having a, at that point, maximum five mana, four or five, maybe that's just the top deck you needed, right? Yeah, I mean, that does exist, 
but one of the things that is nice about hearth elemental is its base power and toughness is a four five which is huge in yep. these spellsy decks oh you know what else is cool you just made me think of this so one of the glaring differences between peasant cube and regular cube is the lack of hard board wipes effectively if something has five toughness in my cube it can't be board wiped that's sort of the break point. That's where it breaks off from Slice and Dice and Feast of Succession are the two main ones. We do have some hard board wipes now. That's a whole other discussion. But most of the time, if it has five toughness, it's not going to be wiped. And you can totally play this in the Slice and Dice deck, which is kind of fun. Yeah, it seems to go pretty well with a bunch of things. So, I mean, it seems pretty good given that it's an uncommon. I don't think it's better than Bedlam Reveler, and I don't think you need two of them. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Ryan Sachs has his cube set up in a way that, like, big brain. <laughs> okay, but most of us aren't like that. <laughs> we're, we're not quite on the uh, 8D chess. One of them's good enough. It's a fireplace. Yep, that's what hearth means. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, next card. All right, next up I've got Red Cap Gutter Dweller, which is two red red for a 3-3 three, three Goblin Warrior with Menace. When Red Cap Gutter Dweller enters the battlefield, create two 1-1 one, one Black Rat creature tokens with this creature can't block. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter on Red Cap Gutter Dweller and exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. This card reads very well. Eric reads okay. <laughs> I mean, it's got a solid base aggressive lean of like it's a 3-3 menace with two extra 1-1s to do something with. Which it tells you what to do with them as it well. It does tell <laughs> yeah. you what to do. But, you know, maybe maybe uh, you've got other things to do with it. But uh, maybe you want those rats to hold a bone split. Yeah. This is the best argument against Decadent Dragon, too. This card's existence? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. There's only so many slots. And this works out pretty well with the Aristocrats decks. It's got the aggro. The fact that it has some card draw, essentially, like the red version of it. I mean, it's just, honestly, it's a, it's a nice little package for a red four drop. It's tough for me to talk about it because I think it's just a good card. It goes in every deck that wants a red four drop. I think, honestly, you add this on top of Hellrider and that. I would say so because it just works in enough variant decks that, like, the only deck it doesn't play well in is the one that Pia and Kieran works in, kind of. That, like, slow, grindy artifact synergies. It works in every deck you're going to play Hellrider in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is this better or worse than Hellrider? Probably still worse. Hellrider is really a beating. Hellrider ends games. Yes. Red Cap Gutter Dweller eventually should give you a way to win. I'll put it this way. If he had haste, then we'd be talking about him versus Hellrider. Yeah, that's fair. All right, so my number three is Gruff Triplets. Three green green for a 3-3 three, three creature satyr warrior. Boy, there better be more. And there's not. Moving on. Yeah, right. I don't know. It's, a, <laughs> it's really weird that this is a rare. Uh, so it's got Trample, <laughs> and when Gruff Triplets enters the battlefield, if it isn't a token, create two tokens that are copies of it. And when Gruff Triplets dies, put a number of plus one plus one counters equal to its power on each creature you control named Gruff Triplets. So the first one that dies turns the other two into six sixes and then when that one dies the last one becomes fucking big <laughs> so it isn't the strongest six drop it's a solid option it will probably be very cheap too i would assume we've actually got a good amount of options in six like there was a solid time four years ago that it was like if this came out before Cogla, we've got primeval titan and uh <laughs> <laughs> and then there was carnage tyrant yeah. Then after Carney T, we were in a drought. Yeah, um, we've got like a bunch now that are... <laughs> now we've got Torvald's Old One-Eye. There's options. I think this is a decent option. It's a beat stick through and through. And it plays with tokens, plays with counters, does all the things. Diversifies the threat a little bit. It's still all got Trample, which like does matter eventually. <laughs> it's just solid. It's at least good enough up to you to make to the decision kind of thing. Yeah. All right, Spooty, number two. 
Okay, this one is gonna have a discussion with it. So this is Pick Lock Prankster. One and a blue for an uncommon fairy rogue. It is a 1-3 with flying and vigilance. It also has an instant adventure, free the fae. One and a blue, mill four cards, then put an instant sorcery or fairy card from among the milled cards into your hand. Among them. I absolutely love that when I was reading through the set, I knew you were going to talk about this. I didn't think it was going to be this high, <laughs> but I knew yeah. I saw it like, oh, this is solid. And then I saw the free of the fae and I was like, yep, can't be talking about this one. Yeah, this is not the second best card in the set for peasant. It's just this is a top five cards for me to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hearth Elemental is better than this card. Almost certainly, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I like this one more. I just think it's neat, Dot Marge. <laughs> yeah. So the body on this card is really good on turn two. The spell is pretty good on turn two. The spell is pretty good on turn seven. The body is awful on turn seven. <laughs> <laughs> And those are the facts that make me look at this card and feel like it could be less amazing after a few sets. But I just love these cards. And the same problem that exists for Spellslinger decks exists for the grave self mill ish kind of decks where those slots end up getting really awkward. Um, those cards only want to be played in, in that particular deck a lot of the time. And that's a lot of slots that you take up trying to support that deck. This is a creature that can be totally good on turn two for the control deck while being a spell. If they need to cast a spell on turn four, you get the spell and the creature. If it's a mill deck, you get the mill effect and you can on turn three, if you've got nothing else to do, all right, put out a blocker. If you're going for more tempo kind of deck, this probably isn't what you're going to be playing. But if you need to, it's a two mana, one, three flying vigilance that you can very easily put a sword on. Works really well with Loxodon Warhammer. Wouldn't you believe it? It's got the evasion and it can still also do the race because it's got vigilance, yeah. It, it doesn't take much. I mean, you put a single counter on it, you know what that makes it? It's a 2-4 flyer. Hell yeah, boy. <laughs> uh, it still doesn't have lifelink then. You'd have to get a little bit fancy, but... Uh... That's why you throw the Loxodon Warhammer. <laughs> so, there are going to be some peasant players that are like, you need to ban Loxodon Warhammer. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> It'll never happen. You need to bring it back. It's not banned until I say it's banned, damn it. <laughs> The one issue I have, and it's not really an issue so much as an annoyance, is the free the fey, mill four cards, then put instant sorcery or fey from among the milled cards into your hand. That is the kind of wording that I'd fuck up constantly. Oh, you'd like try to put something that's already in the graveyard? I would just expect this is a mill card that's getting me an instant or sorcery from the graveyard, right? That's what it would do at rare. That's how it works. I was going to say that you're, you're <laughs> missing something. We don't get that. Yeah. <laughs> I never even considered that fact a single time. It's not like, like I said, it's it's not a game breaker. Like, oh, wow, I can't believe, like, this makes it actually bad. Did you read the No, it's just I would have expected to just be able to get something back from the graveyard, and it doesn't just do that. Actually, you know what's so funny? So I put in the type line fairy in my cube just to see, you know what I mean? Because, like, we're disregarding that, and we should. But there are other fairies in my cube, and one of them is Halo Forager, who ironically allows you to recast an instant or sorcery from your grave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Eric. You know what? How about we start talking about my number two and do something a bit more fun? Mosswood Dread Knight. One in a green for a human knight with trample. It's a 3-2. When it dies, you may cast it from your graveyard as an adventure until the end of your next turn. Oh, what the hell? You can just go backwards? Yeah, you can. We have got Dread Whispers. <laughs> one in a black for a sorcery adventure. You draw a card and then you lose one life. This is a dirtle engine and I fucking love it. I like the card. Hard. My cube supports a whole lot of grave play. Boy ever does it. It does, yeah. <laughs> the problem is this doesn't like getting milled or getting discarded. It has to be itself. True. And that's a weakness when it comes to my cube because I'm playing Vengeviney stuff right now. If you're not focused on that aspect, it does itself looping thing without problem you know like you don't have to add extra support for it to do the thing which is nice but it is a green black card it is a green black card absolutely you aren't playing half of this card and when we get to that it's a lot harder to argue it into the cube that said though the green black is boring as shit 
green black is boring as shit there's so many green black sections that are just like kill spell and it's like well kill spell kill spell kill spell vraska vraska yeah <laughs> how about we how about we do something just slightly different you know just that little bit different it's a dirtle mid-range engine that's not particularly amazing but it's gonna be fun all right, let's talk about what I believe to be the best enchantment card of the set, or enchantment matters at least, maybe not enchantment. All right. Lil Wayne, Casting Couch Director, is <laughs> one green-white for a 2-3 legendary creature, Human Bard. So whenever Lil Wayne, Casting Couch Director, or another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. Create a royal roll token and attach it to that creature. Create a sorcerer roll token and attach it to that creature. Create a monster roll token and attach it to that creature. Now, I do not have the rolls in front of me. I'm going to attempt to do this from memory. I've got them, so I'll tell you when you're wrong. Okay. Monster is plus one, plus one trample. Yes. Sorcerer is plus one, plus one on attack, scry one. Correct. And royal is garbage. <laughs> I was going to say, royal is the really confusing one, right? Not entirely true, but yes, it's plus one, plus one in ward one. Yes, which you may use on him. Yeah, it's fine for him because it pumps him up out of bolt range and gives him the little annoyance of ward. Right, and he uses his human bardness to become royal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Wayne. laughs> this would not work if this was actually lord instead <laughs> wow no lord is different <laughs> uh, so anyway i think this card is phenomenally good as a way to make you want to play auras and enchantments mattering as it stands ignoring the aura deck enchantment deck whatever you want to say right it is a three drop three four with either trample ward one or on attack scry which you won't pick for this guy so it's probably a three four ward one most likely that then every non-token that you put into play gets plus one plus one trample at worst yeah and if it already had trample it gets plus one plus one scry on attack and maybe if you really care, it gets Ward 1 instead. The decks that this is going to go in, ignoring the enchantments, the aura deck, that type of theme, we're green-white. We're either a token deck or a mid-range deck. Yes, and if you are in a mid-range value deck, this thing is going to slap. Yeah, it is. It really is. And it's also kind of cool at the same time. It's not just another generic mid-range creature like Night of Autumn or something like that where you're just like, yep, mm -hmm. yeah. it's good. Get that Does same thing. issue of like, you know, in the Rakdos section, or maybe not Rakdos, maybe more like um, Orzhov section just being like, it's a removal spell. And I mean, it's not the most exciting card I've ever seen, but we're looking at a mid-range creature deck. There's only so much that can be done. <laughs> Yeah, and it's totally skippable, especially if you're trying to go a token route, because it, it is non-token. Yeah. Or it would be super busted. Oh, my God. That'd be real, <laughs> real fun. We, every token scries one when it attacks. <laughs> we'd be we'd be on uh, some type of a let's bust it with you're getting enchantments entering with tokens, and yeah, let's, <laughs> let's figure out this. But it's still a solid card. Very cool. Yeah. As we're talking about here, we're saying not an enchantment thing. Right. If it's an enchantment thing. This is the gateway drug in because if you have an enchantment deck and this guy's in it, yeah. that is a crazy amount of value and shows off why rolls are so important to make that deck work. Yeah. Because you are just constantly creating enchantments that don't get two for one because they aren't real. Mm -hmm. They attach to stuff to trigger enchanted creature stuff and all that jazz. It's all coming together. This is the card that is most important for this deck, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I did the honorable mention of the Elevair. Who I love. It's solid, awesome, but it's only there for that deck. They work reasonably well together, but Casting Director is just good on its own and i like how you won't use the real name no you've ruined it <laughs> and does just so much for that deck the creepy smile on the art holding the crown away from you is why i think of casting couch too he's gonna offer you a roll baby just bend over oh i yeah Yikes. And <laughs> i was gonna make a lot of inappropriate jokes but i was like no nope. i'll take the low route for the team here <laughs> Christian, go to your number one. Get us out of here. No, I think I'll let you keep talking. Why don't you keep <laughs> keep dig, digging yourself? What other things can you think to say, Brad? <laughs> 
Christian, move to your number one. <laughs> what is your favorite card in this set? Oh, boy. Okay, so here's the thing. They finally fucking did it. After all these years, we've been waiting. It's so weird to me this didn't exist. Have we been waiting for it, though? Yeah, no one's been waiting for this except I've for, I guess, I've been you, but... waiting for it for all these years. This is Quick Study. Two to blue for a common instant. Draw two cards. That's all you need. That's all you need in life. Divination and instant speed. You don't have to try to like this card. It just works. I think you have to try to like this card, but okay. No, fuck you. It's obviously better in control than other decks, but it's not bad in almost any blue deck. There are obviously blue decks where you don't want this effect. So here is why this is my number one versus being lower on the list. But like I said, I made my cube update over the past week. And because I'm prepping for some stuff, I have been doing a lot of cube drafts. And over and over and over again, I will be mid draft, like halfway through a pack, or maybe even like only a third of the way through a pack. And I see this come up and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that's that's exactly what I would like right now. As a matter of fact, thank you. And it's just it happens over and over and over again, to the point where every time I see this card, I'm just happy. I'm like, yeah, no, this is exactly what I want. And what's also really cool is that I'm trying to not just have every card in a certain color be the same mana cost, right? Like you you want to spread it out a little bit. At least I do, because it just makes it look better, I guess. I don't I don't like having <laughs> like 15 two drop instants in blue because it's just it feels weird when you go to like build a deck and your curve is just a spike, right? So this becomes one of yet another instance that are playable at three mana in blue. That's not a bad cancel variant. <laughs> yeah. I can think of a cancel variant that also draws two cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doesn't have access to that one, though. You versus the charm that she tells you not to worry about. Oh, is that Archmage's charm? It is. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. But uh, so this, you can compare this somewhat to like all the thirst variants, right? So thirst of discovery, thirst of the other ones. Anyway, it's nice to have not every spell in blue be one to two mana or four to five mana. You know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> yeah, all of my draw spells are two mana or like six. It's just it helps smooth things out. Works well in the spell slinger deck. It's nice because if you have any of the, the things that reduce costs, you know, you don't have to worry about some some of the spells. They'll be like, like multiple pips of the color. And that that kind of sucks when you're like, oh, this doesn't actually reduce the cost. If you get two of those out for some reason, this is one man. You don't have to worry about that. I just love this card. All right. So instead of Eric's number one, let's go to mine because it's a little more boring. How many number ones do you have, Brad? Finally, it's my turn to be the hypocrite. <laughs> you get to cheat now. <laughs> this is my boomer moment. <laughs> So my number one is attacks. It is the virtue cycle. Specifically, white, blue, and red are really good looking in my opinion. So the virtues are a celebration of adventure as a whole. Virtue of knowledge is probably one of my favorite cards from the set. It is four and a blue for an enchantment. If a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability, of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. And then it's got Vantress Visions for one in a blue instant adventure. Copy target activated or triggered ability you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Is it the strongest card? No, but it is fun as hell and everyone loves doubling triggers. It's true. And then Virtue of Loyalty, Virtue of Courage, and the other two, they're all at least fine. No. Nope. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the green one. It's really bad. Strength and Persistence are bad. Yeah. So I like all three of these, I'm going to call them. Uh, the other two at least are part of the cycle. And they're good. Uh, they're a bit boring to talk about because you're like, yeah, it, it's good in adventure cards. Wow, we've never seen that before. Yeah. <laughs> Virtue of Loyalty, I think, will have some play. Yes, it definitely will. That's just efficient and does things well. Like, literally, the bonus adventure part is just create a 2-2 Vigilant at instant speed. At instant speed, and that's the real, like, the <laughs> fuck happened here. Like, all right, yeah, let's do that. The red one's fine. Like The red one is the weakest of the three, in my opinion, that I like, but it's definitely good enough that if you play it, you'll be happy. Yeah, but they are cool, and it is nice to be able to talk about them. So, there you go, my number one. Now, the most important card on this list, Eric, take us home. All right, let's finish off real strong with a Blossoming Tortoise. Two green green for a 3-3 three, three turtle. All right, we're done. Whenever Blossoming Tortoise enters the <laughs> battlefield or attacks, mill three cards, then return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. 
Activated abilities of lands you control cost one less to activate. Land creatures you control get plus one plus one. I love every word on this card. It just keeps getting better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not amazing. Okay. It's pretty good. It's not the best thing ever. It's a dirtle engine, but it is the best type. It's going to be reasonable because if you have access to fetch lands, you're kind of like ramping. But we're here for the the whole landsy deck. I will say a single thing could make this card my dream card. It would have to be a Modern Horizons card. Okay. Creature Turtle Forest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that would be legit. To just get there. And that would make it way scarier and constructive when it's a land and is... Yeah. It feels like that would be the kind of like full theme going on of like, yeah, the the turtle is a land. Like and you mill and find and bring one in tapped of waking up the next turtle and blah blah blah. It would all come together. <laughs> oh. It's turtles all the way down. But as it stands, it still is a very very fun package for that land's deck. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for the lands deck. It's also self mill. Yeah. Which plays into the other parts of green and black that like the lands deck. Yeah. Yep. And blue even in my cube. Specifically, we're talking about my cube. I don't give a shit about your cube audience. The fact that we've got some new man lands that are legit helps. I am so happy for Blossoming Turtle's existence. I expect to see the combo of the green blue land, the new man land, and Blossoming Tortoise just just going to town man it's gonna be fun i'm just imagining this is someone's first time listening to our podcast randomly and they're like <laughs> they put cheeky house mouse only as a off mention <laughs> it's a two one for one with upside it's the greatest thing ever and they put the fucking tortoise that only works in certain archetypes at number one yep we did absolutely and i'll do it again too. my number one was divination i'll show you where that cheeky house mouse is gonna go yeah, I'm just the most excited about Blossoming Tortoise from this set. It just is so cool, man. And I mean, overall, reading all these cards felt fun. The set just feels fun. This is the best set we've had since Neon Dynasty. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's one of the only sets we've had since Neon Dynasty. <laughs> True. <laughs> if you're living right. <laughs> I enjoy it. It was very entertaining to see all these new cards and not many of them are these like holy shit we've done a major step in power level creep no this set kept it realistic it's just interesting unique cards that are not trash but aren't this like modern horizons or you know the last time we were on eldrain with a certain foot fetishist yeah there's a couple <laughs> but tacking adventures onto cards is always going to improve the quality of any discussion yeah it is fun and i mean i think th i like rolls i think they did a good job oh yeah that reminds me i did want to say uh early on i was complaining about rolls my biggest issue with the rolls is it's just the the different types and the slight confusion of trying to learn them that's all i think yeah. that their existence is cool and good for all the reasons that you were saying right they, they do fix enchantments a little bit i will say i wish there was a shorthand reminder text version on the rares and mythics there exactly. Isn't. They they either Some do like the did. whole lengthy awful reminder text, yeah. or they just don't put any, and it's like you could just put plus one plus one scry on attack, or plus one plus exactly. one trample, or plus one plus one ward one on his reminder text, and that would be enough for me to remember my rolls. Yep. Yeah, that's the biggest problem I have with it, because it's like you you start, you're like, all right, what does young hero do if you blah, 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 put this and that? And the, OK, what's that? like you get halfway through and you haven't even started learning what the card actually does, because in my case, it's the only <laughs> roll token. Yeah, <laughs> just tell me. And then like on top. Sorry, now I'm going on a rant on top of that. It's like whenever it attacks, if it's toughness is three or less, put a plus one counter on it. I get it's for balance, but like it's just so many niches. I really don't like the young hero role, and I don't like the, uh, what was the other one called? Wicked. Those are the two that I think are... <sighs> Wicked's fine. They're overly wordy for an effect that doesn't matter. Like it's too much thought for too little payoff. I think Wicked's fine. I almost feel like I would rather it just be give it like plus one plus one in some yep. cases. 
Yeah. All right. That is the end of the episode, though. A great set overall. Very happy. So I guess let's get out of here and go thank the patrons. Sounds good. Let's do it.